All right, any parting questions on PA2? The free function? Yeah, definitely. So we got a linked list, we want to free all the memory associated with that. We've got a free function, we're going to pass it the sentinel node, which is the address of the sentinel. So a pointer to this first block. So how do we traverse a list? We typically do something like, um, like this, temp equals sentinel next, while temp is not null. do some stuff and then move down the list. And when we exit the loop, we know that we've we've done whatever we're doing in here to this last block. Okay? So really what we want to do in here is free temp. But the problem is that if we free temp, then we can't use temp to find the next node. So we can, we can do a couple of things. We could say free me equals temp, right? Remember where this node is pointing. So the first time through, temp is sentinel next. Temp is not null. Okay, we can set free me to be equal to temp. We can change temp to be the next node. And now we can say free, free me. So that gets rid of that. Come to the top of the loop, temp's not null. Set free me equal to this. Set temp equal to the next node. Free free me, that gets rid of that node. Come up to the top again, temp is not null. Set free me equal to this. Set temp equal to temp next. Well, this is the end of the list, so now temp is null. Free free me, that gets rid of that. Come back to the top, while temp is not null, we're gonna exit the loop. And so then at this point, the only thing we have left is the sentinel, and we can just free the sentinel. And that gets rid of that. If you're going to that order, you be, you be careful about uh, empty lists. No, uh, the last non sentinel node, if you're finding it while temp not equal null, and then you set temp equal to null before you free free me. Mm -hmm. Right, so so temp was down here on the last node. Um, I set free me to that last node. I sent temp to whatever was next, which is now null. Which would then exit the while loop. But not until I get back to the top of the while loop. Right, I'm going to do that. I'm still going to free free me, and then I'm going to come back up to the while loop. Wouldn't it break if the condition was no longer true? No. That would be a cool feature, though. But no, that, that condition only gets checked when you go back up to the top of the while loop. Oh. Right, so just, just think of an if that happens up there. Right, you could check the condition and break, but no, it doesn't happen automatically. It kind of maybe does in Verilog, but but not in C. What? Oh, have you done engineering 250? Uh, oh gosh, I have. Oh. <laughs> Verilog is a hardware definition language, and it looks like C, except things tend to happen in parallel. So. Yeah. Ah, good. All right, does that help with freeing? Okay. Yeah. So, at the end of uh, PA2, do you want us to free all the... Uh, also, so that's also a Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'll run it through Valgrind and, and probably like five points if you have memory leaks. Okay. 
Not a big deal. Be kind to your memory. All right, other PHU questions? Yeah. It's kind of weird to what we were talking about the other day, but say if you get some, like your code basically on the book, do you want us to put like page number and like, you know how you do like in a, in a Like a reference? Page, yeah. Are you talking about code C code or pseudo code? No, my C code is like on, I found like for the free, I was looking at in like my C book. Okay. And it had basically like files that didn't have that stuff out. Okay. Um, doesn't doesn't hurt to put it in if you really took it pretty much verbatim. Yeah, I would just throw in a comment and say, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do that too sometimes. Even though I'm writing code for myself, it's like sometimes I'll just look something up and I'll just throw in a comment and say, you know, I got this from this website or something. So yeah, um, probably not an issue. But it doesn't hurt to put it in. So I want to talk about PA3 today, um, and PA3 is about hashes, and we didn't get to talk about hashes yesterday. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hashes, but I really want to spend most of the time talking about PA3. So um, you may want to look at the lecture video from yesterday's A section, because we spent pretty much the whole time talking about hashes. Um, but I'll just... If, if you need to understand something about hashes to understand what we're saying about PA3. Um, but we'll talk more about hashes next week also. But let me give you the, the abbreviated rundown on hashes. Um, what we're going to be doing for PA3 is we're going to be making a database of license plates and names. Okay, I'm going to give you a file that's structured with a license plate, a first name, and a last name. And your program is going to read those into memory. And then the user can put in a license plate, and your program will tell them the name of the person associated with that plate. OK, so it's a basic lookup. And actually, let me, sh let me show you what the program does first. And then, um, and then we'll talk about how we use hashes for this. So on the server, I've put a copy of this under slash temp slash plate. Okay, that's an executable version of a solution to PA3. And when you run this, you have to give it the name of a license plate database. Okay, and there's a database that I'm supplying to you under slash temp, conveniently called database.txt. And it's randomly generated license plates and randomly paired first names and last names. So if you find your name in here and it's your license plate, it's not my fault, it's a coincidence. Um, but I just found some lists of first names, last names, and just randomized, put them together. Um, and so there's a thousand license plates in here, okay? So if I say temp plate and I give it the name of a database, um, it pulls in all of that information. And now I can say, give me a license plate. Well, let's do um, PTN673, and it tells me that's Rochelle Mueller. And if I put in ABC123, it tells me that plate's not found. Okay, now we could do this just by reading everything into a set of arrays. We could load this in, the first column goes into a plate array, the second into a first name, the third into a last name. And when we want to search for a plate, we just make a little for loop and we go through the whole plate array and we check each entry to see if it matches ABC123. Right? So that will get you the behavior, but that's not the goal. The goal is to implement this using what's called a hash. Okay, so this kind of problem is, is custom made for a hash table. Um, what's a hash table? It's kind of like an array containing a first name and a last name. And how do you access the elements of this array? Instead of doing it with index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we can do this with index BLD974 or index um, HQJ719. We can use strings to index this array. 
So a hash is an array that we can access by using something other than just consecutive integers starting from zero. It's a more powerful array. And this is sometimes called an associative array. Well, if we have an array that we can index with things like license plates, then this problem is really easy to solve. Because what will I store at the entry indexed by BLD974? I'll store the first and last name of the plate, of the name associated with that plate. And down here, I'll store the first and last name associated with that plate. And if you ask me for array bracket ABC123, the system should somehow come back and say that's not a valid index. That tells me there's no data associated with that plate. Yeah? So does it have any indices in general, you can set up a hash to be indexable by anything you want, including integers. Okay. Ultimately, yeah. And that's what we're going to do is we're going to see how to implement this. But when we're using a hash, we're kind of thinking of it as like, you know, array bracket quoted string or array bracket picture. And we might index this array with pictures. And if you want to know the name of a picture, you put that into your index and out pops the name. Okay, so how does this work? This is, this is built around the idea of what's called a hash function. And a hash function, let me just think of it as h, takes some string and it gives you back an integer. It actually gives you back an integer up to, I don't know, let's say this is actually my hash table. It has eight entries in it. My hash function will take a license plate and give me back an integer between 0 and 7. So it gives me an index into a plain old array that I'm using to build this hash table. And the hash function is just some mathematical function. Typically, it takes the ASCII characters of each, um, the ASCII codes of each character in your string and combines them using some mathematical formula and ultimately comes up with a number between 0 and 7 in this case. And so if you want to store an entry for ABC123, we run that through our hash function. And let's say that gives us the number 4, well that's this spot right here and I'm going to store the name of, of whoever I want to associate with that plate, so obviously stick Michael Jackson there. Um, and now when I want to search for who owns license plate ABC123, I run that through my hash function, I get a 4, that's Michael Jackson. This is really efficient. Because what I just did, take ABC123, add up the ASCII codes and do something to get a 4, go to index 4, there's the name. That operation is not affected by how big this array is or how much data is in there. I could have a billion things in here, and when I come in with a license plate, all I got to do is run it through the hash function, get an integer, go to that location. It's order 1. It's a fixed amount of time no matter how much data you have, which is pretty sweet. Except for one minor detail. So what's the minor detail? Two minor details. What's the other minor detail? <laughs> Um, that's not going to be a big issue. There is some consideration about the hash function, but, but this is usually something that's pretty quick to calculate. But there's a really big problem with this. Yeah, so what if, what if I 
try to store our license plate, which is, you know, dog uh, 111. What if that also hashes to a 4? Am I going to wipe out Michael Jackson and put down the owner of dog 111 in here? Or am I going to say, I can't store that because Michael Jackson is, is occupying that spot? Right? So this is called a collision. When you have something that's trying to go into your hash table at the same place that you've already got an entry, you have a problem. And there's different ways to deal with collisions. We're going to use an approach called chaining. And you're going to love this. So here's our hash table. We're not going to store the first name and last name in our hash table. What we're going to store in here is a pointer to a sentinel node. And that sentinel node is going to be the beginning of a linked list. And every name we want to store at index 0 is going to go into that linked list. So down here at entry 4, this is going to be the address of a sentinel node. And that sentinel node is normally going to be null. But when we get our entry ABC123, we're going to create a new node, and we're going to store the license plate. We're going to store the first name. We're going to store the last name. And we're going to store a pointer to the next node, which is null. So now is ABC123 in the, in the database. Well, we'll take that function, we'll hash it to a 4. We get the sentinel node of a linked list. Now we just search that linked list the old-fashioned way. And hey, guess what? First one we check, ABC123, there's the license plate. So now we get dog 111, and that codes to location 4. So we're going to make a new entry. And it's going to have the license plate and whatever the name of the owner is, and a pointer to next. And we're going to insert that into the linked list. And we're just going to be lazy and insert it into the beginning of the linked list. So now our list looks like that. So now if you're looking for dog 111 or ABC123, you run those through the hash function, you get a 4. You look there, there's the address of a sentinel node. And now you just do your PA2. Well, okay, here's a sentinel node of a linked list. Does it have a node with the plate equal to dog 111? If it does, let's find the name. Oh, the first name's good, last name is dog. If you get to the end of your list and you haven't found this, you can say that's not in the hash table. So what are the limits of this, uh, the linked list part? There really aren't any. So, um... It's just a better array. I'm yeah, it's, it's a better array, but it can grow without bounds until we run out of memory. On the other hand, it, it kills your performance the longer it gets. Because all this glorious stuff about putting a plate and you know exactly where it's stored, well, that isn't quite true anymore. And if these lists are, you know, two or three nodes, that's not a big deal. You'll have to do two or three operations to find what you're looking for. But if they grow to be thousands of nodes long, it's taking you thousands of operations. But if you have a thousand entries in your hash table and you have a million pieces of information stored, and each linked list is a thousand nodes, well, you can find something with a thousand operations instead of a million. That's pretty good. But then, couldn't you have just a linked list where each node has a pointer to a sentinel to the next linked list? Instead right, of but you still have to search that first linked list to know which linked list, which sentinel you want to pursue your search down. Aren't we doing the same thing with the hash table? No, because the hash table we don't have to search. Right, we put in our key, our plate, run it through a hash function. It tells us if your data is in this structure, it's in this list four. Oh, okay. Right? And we don't have anything here that will tell us what everything is that's stored in there. Right? So if we search through sequentially, you wouldn't know which list to look down. You basically have to do them all.
Yeah. So essentially the performance is based on like how good your hash function is. Yes. Because if it's like really good, then you'd have almost nothing in yeah. the list. But if it was really bad, then you'd have like one main list of everything. Yep. The hash function is vitally critical. That's probably not proper. It's extremely critical or extremely vital um, to the performance of uh, to the good performance of a hash table. Are you um, gonna make us come up with a hash function? No, I'm gonna give you a hash function, which is not a really great one, but but it's Are we it's okay. To mess with it? You can mess with it, but the one you turn in, I gotta use my hash function. All right, so that's the basic setup. Okay, we're going for an associative array that we can index with something other than just zero, one, two, three, four. And we're implementing it with this this hash table concept, which is using this this hash function to take something a string in this case and give us an index to start looking. And what we're going to find at that index in our hash table is basically a linked list, and we search that linked list. So that's going to let us build our database of license plates. I don't think I want to close it. So we can search for, you know, plates. And we've got a few other commands we can use. So when, when you run your program, normally you type something in, it's a license plate, it's gonna search for it. And if, it, if it's not found, it'll just say plate not found. But you got two commands you can also type in. Commands start with an asterisk. So I can say asterisk load, and it'll show me how long each link list is. So my hash table for this run right here is 100 entries. So it's an array of, of 100 sentinel nodes, or 100 pointers to sentinel nodes. And it's showing me how long each link list is. Well, they're all roughly 10, right? I have 1,000 license plates. I have 100 places to store them. So you'd expect the average length of a link list would be 10. But, you know, some of them are only three, like down here at entry 94. This one is 15. Um, there's a 17 up here, right? So load shows you the length of each link, link list. And then there's a dump command, which lets me look at what the link list is in, in a particular location. So I can say star dump 94, and it shows me what's in the link list at cell 94 in my hash. So it's three names, three license plates. Those don't have to be sorted in any particular No. Um, always insert at the beginning of the list. And they'll come out in this order. So if I dump cell 85, which it tells me has a length of 15, I should see 15 license plates stored. And if I dump a cell that's not valid, it should give me an error message. Okay, you can also say dump without specifying a cell, and that will show you the contents of every cell in your hash. So it's just like calling dump 100 times in this case. And then to exit the program, control D. Okay, at the very beginning of your input, hold on, control, press D. That should register end of file. And you should free all the memory after you exit, or before you exit, but after you decide to exit. Okay, so that's the intended behavior and appearance. And I want you to use this, this sample program to make sure that you're outputting things the same way that I am. I'm gonna be really picky about format. Okay, we'll talk about details of that in a minute. The other thing you can do with template, if you run it without arguments, it should give you a usage message. You have to specify a database, but you can also specify a hash size. How big do you want your hash table to be? So if I want to make my hash table five entries, well, if I look at the load, I've got about 200 things in each linked list, which is sort of what you'd expect. And if I look at what's in, you know, entry zero, it's, it's 200 and some names. So it's a really long linked list, and it's not very efficient. But if you made it 1,000? Yeah, if I make it 1,000, I'd expect... Um, a more balanced load, but I don't get that, right? A lot of these lists are empty. And then somewhere up around here, 
I start seeing a few lists with a node, and now I see some twos, and now I've got a section where most of my lists are populated. But then and there's some threes and fours. But this would be faster, but there's a ten. And then when I start getting up to the upper part of my hash table, I'm back to zeros. So this is reflective of a poor hash function. This is what we call clustering. We have a thousand spots in our hash table. We have a thousand pieces of information to store. We would hope that it had pretty much put one per cell, which would make the efficiency of searching really nice. But it's clustering, right? Most of our data is being stored between around 150 and going up to around um, maybe 550. So about 400 cells are occupied by most of the data. It's a poor hash function. And there's one outlier down here, 979, right? Most of these are unused. That's an unusual license plate that happened to hash to a bigger integer than the others. Um, we can look at that entry. All right, so that was GDB for fun. All right, and then Control-D to exit. All right, so, so this is posted. This is six pages. Um, one of your tasks, possibly for you know, today or this weekend, is to go through this and, and translate it into something that makes sense for you. Checklists or, you know, a different order or, or whatever pieces or something, right? This has all the information in it, but this may not be the, the optimal thing to work from. Um, but let me run you through this and tell you what's in here, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll dig into some of the structures. So I've already given you the basic lowdown, right? You're going to read in a database. You're going to let the user search for things in that database. And you're going to implement this using a hash table. Um, behavior, um, run slash temp slash plate, right, to see what this thing should be outputting. Um, when you show the contents of a cell, I want to see the plate, and then I want to see the name with last name, comma, first. And I want to see contents of cell and the number of the cell, and then I want some kind of, of separator under that. So that if I say dump, well, right, it, it makes it easy to follow. If you have um, a few different, like that, it, for, for the last one, for example, mm -hmm. would you care if all the names are padded so it's in columns? Or Mm, I'd rather you don't. So if, if you say plate equals instead of plate colon, that's okay. okay. But if you say name and you do um, first name space last name, that's going to be a deduction. Okay. I really want you to stick to this format, and there's, there's reasons for that. Um, I want to see contents of cell and see the cell number, and then I want one node per row. Right, and then throw in a separator, a line of dashes or something um, at the end. So if I dump all of them, I get, you know, a nice easy um, to break up visually. Um, if I type in a license plate, oh, I forgot my license plates from last night. Um, if I type in a license plate, I want to see two lines of output, first name followed by the first name, then last name followed by the last name. Okay, if you just print out last name comma first, that's not the same thing. What if that is padded so that last name has a space after it so that the colons match up? Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> All right, so, so minor cosmetic details are fine, okay? But anything that, that basically involves, um, you know, presenting different information, uh, don't do. All right. Starting the program, you got two options, either plate followed by the database name or plate followed by the database name and an integer showing the size of the hash you want to use. And if you do an invalid integer, Right, like negative 10 or 0, which is not a valid size for a hash table, or you do something that's not an integer, or you do um, 
you know, something additional, right? Those are all errors. Just give a usage message and exit. So really strict. If they don't give an integer, don't just let scanf return a, a 10 and, and run with a 10 or something. So from the usage, you have slash temp slash plate. Did you just put that in as that? Or That'll be whatever you called it. So if you copy that to some other executable, it'll be whatever your executable name is. That's argv bracket zero. So it'll fill in whatever your program is that you ran. All right, so your program should report an error, so you don't have to say error, you can say usage. Um, but report that this is a problem and then exit. And if you exit abnormally, return a one. If you exit normally at the end of your program, return a zero. Okay, so make sure your main is of type int and just return one, return zero. Okay, database looks like this. So, um, license plate, space, first name, space, last name, and then there's a new line at the end, if you're reading this with fgets. Get rid of the spaces, get rid of the new line. Right, so here the plate should be seven characters, here the first name should be four characters, the last name should be seven characters. If you keep the new line at the end of the last name, your hashes will be off, because you'll be doing an extra character, ten. So you want to truncate that new line when you call fgets. And you can assume, I didn't put this in here, you can assume that the names in here are not going to be too long. So if you give yourself 100 characters for the plate, the first name and the last name, it should be fine. I'm not going to give you, you know, war and peace for somebody's name. Um, all right, you've seen the user interaction. The person types in a plate, and it either says the information for that plate or it says plate not found. Three legal commands, which begin with an asterisk, uppercase. Um, anything else is assumed to be a plate search. And then again, just in here, what the output should look like. So plate, um, load factor on each cell, and contents of the list in a cell. If, you, um, we're not going to get any weird names with apostrophes or anything like that. You could. Anything other than a space or a new line is, well, I won't do tabs. Anything other than white space, right? And your plate may not be three letters, a dash, and three digits. Could be anything. Okay, so just break it up with white space. So S scan F will work on this great. Percent S, percent S, percent S. If you're doing anything other than that, you're probably working too hard. So just take your string from F gets and just S scan it with three percent S's, throw it into plate first and last where those are sufficiently large character arrays. And that should be all the parsing you need to do for plate data. Exit with end of file, control D, so fgets will return a null when you hit control D, or if you're reading from a file or a redirection and you hit end of file, fgets will return null. Okay, And that's the only condition under which you want to exit. If they dump a cell that doesn't exist, if they type in a command that you don't understand, if they type in a plate that you don't find, don't exit the program. The only time you exit is after they hit control D. And before your program exits, clear up the memory. All right, implementation. So you're going to implement two data structures, a linked list and a hash table. A linked list you've basically already done in PA2, except your node looks like this. Instead of an integer number, it has three data fields, a plate, a first name, and a last name. And you need to declare those as car star. Don't hardwire them to be you know, car plate bracket 100. Okay, they should just be declared as a car star. We're going to dynamically allocate space for them when we need it. So three character pointers, three strings called plate first and last, and then a pointer to the next struct node. Other than that change, this works exactly like PA2. Okay, the only real difference is your data is not just a single integer, it's three strings. Okay, and the list contains sentinel nodes as usual, just like PA2. And then you're also going to implement a hash table. So here's, here's the first pretty tricky aspect of this. Our linked list is composed of struct node stars. So if we think of our sentinel, 
It's a pointer to a struct node. Our hash table is supposed to be an array of pointers to struct nodes, which we can think of as sentinels, but it's not a sentinel node. It's really just a pointer, right? So it's really a pointer to that first sentinel. OK, let's introduce a type def. Let's take this struct node star, and let's call that a hash entry. So each of these things is a hash entry. Pointer to a struct node. So this whole thing, this is an array of hash entries. Well, if we have an array of integers, how do we declare it? We say integer star. If we have an array of characters, how do we declare it? Character star. If we have an array of hash entries, how do we declare it? Hash entry star. That's what your hash table is. So your hash table is declared as a hash entry star. And we're thinking of it as an array of hash entries. And so if I say something like hash table bracket 2, that's this thing right here. That's a hash entry, which is a struct node star. That's a pointer to a struct node. In particular, it's a pointer to a sentinel node of a linked list containing all of the data that hashed to location 2. So, so lining these things up takes some work. It takes, takes some, some head scratching. Um, but it's really nothing that you haven't done already. Right? It's, it's just sort of keeping track of what's what. So make a struct node star for hash entry. And then your hash table is just a pointer to a hash entry or an array of hash entries. Don't predefine it, though. Don't say hash entry, hash table, bracket 100. Because we don't know what the hash table size is going to be until our program is running. OK, also don't assume that these strings in your node have a fixed length. We're going to allocate memory dynamically. So Oh, yeah. can you define anything, like two things to the same thing? What does that mean? So, for example, if we have the node struct, mm -hmm. can you say type def struct node star sentinel and then type def struct node yeah, node yeah. star? Yeah, you can type def multiple things to the same. Because we're going to think of the struct node star as, as a node in the linked list, but also as an entry in the hash table. So you might want two type decks. All right, deeper details. Here's the hash function we're using. So I'm assuming plate is an array of characters. We're going to basically sum from i equals 0 to the length of that string minus 1. So that's the number of characters. And we're going to do the following calculation. i plus 5, i is the index. i plus 5 times character i in the string. We're going to add all those, those, those up, and we're going to reduce it modulo whatever the hash table size is. So suppose hash table size equals 25. And suppose um, plate is hello. And our function is sum from i equals 0 to length of the string minus 1, i plus 5 times character i, modulo 25 in this case. So what does this turn out to be? i is equal to 0. We're going to take 5 times whatever the ASCII code for h is. 
and then we're going to set i equal to 1, so it's going to be 6 times the ASCII code for E, 7 times the code for L, 7, 8 times the code for L, and 9 times the code for O. And you add all of that up, divide by 25, take the remainder, that's going to give you a number between 0 and 24. And our hash table size is 25, so we can index it with indices between 0 and 24. So this is giving us an index. So you have to write a hash function that implements that function, and it's a for loop with a running sum, and what you add each time is your index plus 5 times the character at that position. Make it interesting. <laughs> There's a whole science to making good hash functions. This is not a good hash function, but it's better than if we just did I. It tends to spread things out a little more, but I was in a mood, so I added five. <laughs> it's a good question, though. All right, so here's the functions you want to write. For the hash, you need to make a hash init function, and you have to tell this what the hash size is. How many entries do I want in my hash table? And it should return a pointer to a hash entry. So you have to do some malloking. You have to basically create an array of hash entries of size, hash size. So make a temporary pointer to a hash entry and set it equal to malloc hash size times size of hash entry. That's probably worth writing down. Each element in our array is going to need whatever the size of a hash entry is. Multiply that by hash size. That's not a pointer, that's a multiplication. And that tells you how many bytes you need. And we can save that in a temporary. And now temp bracket anything is a hash entry, which is a struct node star. We need to malloc the space for this array of struct node stars. And then we need to initialize each of those linked lists. I was going to ask why if hash entry is already typed up to a struct node star, why you're starring temp, and then I realized you're going to use that. Yeah, temp is an array of, of hash entries. You don't want it to be a pointer to it. I want it to be a pointer to the type of thing that it's an array of. So it's actually a struct node star star. But I didn't want to say that out loud. <laughs> but if you take away the type def, this is a star star, pointer to pointers. It's the same as argv. It's an array of pointers. All right, so once we do this, we can index this temporary variable with an integer and that will be, you know, that entry, that cell of the hash table, which should be a pointer to a sentinel node. Well, it's not yet. We haven't actually made that happen. So we're going to need to initialize that. You're going to need to call your linked list init function, which should return a sentinel node of an empty list. So do hold. Do we want to do that right away and init every single hash entry to a sentinel? Or? You definitely need to make sure that this is all initialized before you start using the hash table. So you want to make sure that, that all of these entries are set up to point to a sentinel node of an empty list. What if instead of doing that, we checked to see if it was already set up and then added it once we had to add a node? You can do that. You can initialize it to null and check for that. 
but I want you to do it this way though. But it would be more efficient to just set it to null and then initialize it on demand. All right, so this initializes a hash table, hash add takes a hash table and then a plate, first name and last name, and it adds it to the hash. How does it do that? Run play through your hash function, right, this one up here. Get an index, hash table bracket that index is the sentinel node of a linked list. So call the add method for a linked list and tell it to add the first name and last name and plate to the list. And we're always going to add in the beginning of our linked list because there's no reason to try to alphabetize or sort the linked list. So the fastest way to add to a linked list is just insert right in the beginning after the sentinel node. So we're always going to insert in the beginning. Hash find is a search. Again, take a plate, use that through your hash function to get an index in the hash table. That's a sentinel node. Search that linked list for the plate. If it finds it, populate the first and last fields with the first and last data in that node and return a one. If it doesn't find it, leave these unchanged, return a zero. So it's like a scanf mindset. Could we have just returned the pointer to the linked list node instead and then not had to give it all of that? Just give it the, the Sure, that's, that's fine in general, but not here. <laughs> Right, I'm really going to be a stickler. I really want it done this way. Um, only because it, it uh, makes the grading more uniform more easily. But yeah, you could do that. That would be, that would be a fine variation. Um, hash load, figure out how, how long the linked list is in each cell and print it out. So this function actually prints. Right? Um, so, so we can go through these more, but here's the most important takeaway from this assignment. Um, your main program is only going to interact with your hash. It's only going to care about these hash functions. Your hash code is going to care about these linked list functions. Your linked list functions are going to care about arrow next, arrow plate, um, and so on and so forth. But I want you to think about this separation of functionality. Right? Your linked list code, PA2, has to deal with all this low-level stuff, null and pointers and moving down a list and so on and so forth. Your hash function doesn't have to deal with that. When your hash function wants to add something to the hash, it hashes your plate to get an index. That's a sentinel node. Call your list add function on that sentinel. And your main program doesn't care anything about linked lists. Your main program gets a license plate from the database and wants to store it in the hash. It just calls hash add. It gets a query from the user and wants to search for it. It calls hash find. So I want you to implement these functions with these prototypes and these behaviors, but I want you to be thinking about taking advantage of this hierarchy, right? I can implement my hash add by going through the linked list and having a previous and a current and searching and all this kind of stuff, right? But don't do that. Once you have a sentinel node of a list, just call the appropriate list functions. And your list functions you can make with a little bit of modification from PA2. It's a more complex node and you have to print out more fields. Um, and there's this length function which prints the length of the list. So start this early, but start by working through the assignment on paper, figure out exactly what it's asking you for. Come up with some kind of plan of attack and I've, I've suggested some some approaches in here to um, you know what you can start with and, and go on next and so on. Um, but spend some time thinking about that and think about these functions and how they're going to fit together. And when you're writing pseudocode, try to use these functions. If you're doing pseudocode for, for a hash find, right, it's really only three or four steps if one of those steps uses the list find function and one of them uses the hash function, right? You don't have to be writing summation for loops and stuff like that if you have a function called hash that takes a plate and gives you an integer. So think about modularizing like that. Okay, and then the general suggestion, other than starting early and, and planning ahead like that, ask me lots of questions. Okay, if you're getting stuck on this, if, if you're, you're getting into more and more 
sheets of paper to, paper to write out your pseudocode and you don't think you're going down the right path, let me know. Okay, if you're not sure how to go further than you've gone, let me know. Um, and absolutely, if something doesn't make sense, I don't understand what this hash function does, right? Um, don't wait a week before asking. <laughs> okay, you want two weeks to work on this. This is a, a much more complex assignment than PA2. This is taking the place of what used to be the killer assignment. Um, and it's only PA3. But the pieces are not that complex in themselves. Doesn't mean that I expect you to be able to bang them out in two minutes. But when you, when you know how to write this particular piece of it, you'll see it's not a really complex piece of code. But there's a lot of these not very complex pieces of code and they have to work together. And that's where the complexity is. It's in figuring out how to make all of this sort of work with each other into your final program. So it's, it's much more about the planning and the organization than about the actual coding. Okay, submission on GitLab, plate PA3 with that spelling and that casing. Include your C files, your H files, your make file, and don't include, you can put in a readme, but don't include your .os, your executable. Okay, just the source files that I can use to build your executable. I'm two minutes over, but I'll say one more thing. Before you decide you're done with this, follow this last paragraph. Go into an empty directory, pull your repository back, say make, say plate, and see if it works. If it doesn't work, it's not going to work for me. Okay, this is a really simple last test, but it catches all the things like I changed my make file at the last minute and had a problem with it, or I forgot to include hash dot h, or I added a comment and I broke my C code. Right, all of those this will catch. So when you're when you think you're done new directory, git clone to pull your repo into this totally empty directory, should just be able to say make. If you have to go off and set something up first before a make will compile, that's a problem because I'm not going to know to do that. Okay, so try to mimic the experience I'm going to have when I start grading these. And that, that'll save a lot of, of needless point losses. All right, thanks for hanging out over time. Um, I will see you next time.